I've done multiple startup gigs to actually like end up where I am. For a lot of people here who are okay. probably like looking at it, yeah. what does yeah. pre-iPhone mean is yeah. not something that like they would understand. Precisely. Yeah. People are back to actually like thinking that Blackberry is a fruit and at that time people were like thinking Blackberry, <laughs> Blackberry was a phone. A phone. <laughs> the product market fit is all about trying to find by customers who derive value. Correct. to derive the maximum value to, from your product, yeah. right? And that's why I said, and it needs to be repeatable. It's almost like saying, if you want to actually, it's like going from the one end of the football field to the another end of the football field. Right. And if you're able to do it, you probably get to the IPO, yeah. right? Yeah. Or your exit, right? Yeah. Whatever exit that you want. That's a great if, analogy. Welcome to another fantastic episode of Pitch Cafe Podcast. We are here today with someone who's literally on a rocket ship startup. His startup, Firework, went from zero to 750 million in just about three years. I'm most privileged here to be speaking with Anand Vidyanand. He's a rock star from Chennai in India, but also he carries the logo of Stanford University. When I heard him at a recent talk at the ATEA Catalyze conference, I was blown away by his insights on growth. If you want to build a startup that is a rocket ship in three years, you don't want to miss this episode. You know, I've had so many conversations with you and I regret that I did not record every one of them. So this conversation is being recorded. So let's get straight to the point. Perfect. Sounds good. Fantastic. So uh, Alan, tell me, you are co-founder of Firework. I joined uh, into Firework with the right. founding team. Uh, so, there were mm -hmm. two founders who had actually started the company ahead of it. Mm -hmm. And right at the time that they were pivoting mm -hmm. from being an app mm -hmm. into a platform mm -hmm. was when you actually joined. I joined. Them. And the rocket ship took off. Tell us what was Firework like before the pivot and why did you guys pivot? There are like two ways that you can actually like think about it. One is like when you actually are like starting together on something, you actually think that this is going to go somewhere. Yeah. And you feel that that pain that you are actually feeling to solve mm -hmm. is something that everybody is going to like understand. So when Firework started off, it started off as an app, which was almost like TikTok. And then suddenly you get hit with like a crazy scenario like TikTok coming into existence. Yeah. So what was the earlier version of Firework doing? What was the app like? What it was just about videos. It's almost exactly like TikTok. Everybody starts posting videos. Mm. And this was before TikTok actually became TikTok. Mm. And so they thought that they had it ahead of TikTok coming to the US. Mm -hmm. But then you get blindsided and this is not something that you can predict when a very large player like ByteDance comes in with TikTok yeah. and takes over the market. Yeah. So at that point, you have one of two choices. You keep fighting and you know that you might be in a losing battle yeah. or you actually make a strong pivot. And as an entrepreneur, sometimes you have to make those strong pivots. So tell us, uh, how, do you, how does an entrepreneur know that they have to make a pivot? What does their uh, profit and loss statement look like? Or what are the indicators that this is the time to pivot? Is there like a formula for that? So there's like two or three and at each stage, the mm. pivot is going to be different. Mm. When you start off, mm. if you're like actually feeling like one, the customers are not picking up, they're not actually understanding the pain or the pain is not hard enough mm -hmm. that it's something that they actually want to like buy, mm -hmm. then there's something amiss. Mm -hmm. There is a product market fit problem. Mm -hmm. right or there is a value proposition problem the second is if there is a very large entrant that there is absolutely no way that you can overcome yeah especially in the d2c space yeah and they're going to pour in marketing money just like what tiktok did then you have to actually like really take a hard thought to see whether you want to pivot so when you joined uh, how did you come to the current value proposition uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now with firework why your company is valued at 750 million and you just uh, ha raised uh, about $200 million recently in your Series B. So tell us, what was it like when you came? What was the energy like? And you know, what were people saying? And how you, what does Firework do right now? Let's start from probably the time at which we actually like pivoted. When we pivoted, uh, it's a very hard pivot. 2020, right? 2020. And why do you call it hard pivot? How many people were there? How much were you spending on the pivot? So it was not about, we, we didn't really ma make much money. We had to mm. actually take a strong bet mm. about saying, okay, we are now going to become a platform. Going from an app to a platform yeah. is 
almost like an impossible task and i have to give big kudos to the engineering team and the product team that so actually why, like, did why it why is it impossible to go from app to platform when you're an app you're in complete control of your technology stack when you become a platform you're building it so that it can work with any technology stack outside so it's a very different mindset that yeah. you have to actually like take in yeah. the way that you have to architect so one to one versus one to many correct so yeah. the in in the one to one scenario where you're like building your own app yeah. you can make all the choices that you want and there is no implication on it right if you're building a platform there is a huge implication because it needs to work with every customer correct that you might actually end up having and right. you have to make it as generic as possible right that's where the normally it becomes a big challenge on the engineering and product side i would say that we did a great job in doing that the second thing is the mindset needs to change mm, that's a hard one right. how do you change the mindset of a team if you're dealing with people they're harder than technology <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it it means that it's change of people oh right that's why they got you in so right. when when there is different people who have actually done certain things uh, and you have to adapt right yeah. even it's not just about the people coming in the entrepreneurs have to adapt everybody has to adapt and right. every pivot Yeah there are some people who are going to survive and yeah. some people who are not going to survive our first pivot was to actually become a platform yeah and we thought we would actually like do that with media companies right who already had videos and who would need something like what we are actually like doing right. to actually enable it on their own website we started off with like a co-advertising model partnership model of trying to actually like advertise and monetize did not really work mm mm uh was a huge challenge when did you realize it was not working probably 6 to 9 months in gosh <laughs> right uh, of the platform and then you again have to make a pivot mm a second right? pivot a second pivot but these become not necessarily product platform pivots mm. it also is business model pivots right. it's cust- target customers pivots it's mm. target market pivots mm. right and as an entrepreneur that's the most important thing if you really think about it i would say that an entrepreneur is almost like person catching the ball in a american football field yeah. and trying to run the entire 100 yards then you have to tackle all these obstacles that yeah. are coming your way yeah so you have to constantly keep moving direction yeah so that you're putting the uh, obstacles out uh, it's almost like saying if you want to actually it's like going from the one end of the football field to the another end of the football field right and if you are able to do it you probably get to the ipo yeah, right yeah. or your exit right yeah. whatever exit that you want that's a great If- analogy talking about american football <laughs> field <laughs> that's amazing you know now i can totally visualize so it gets harder as you uh, get towards your target you get a lot more resistance yeah. but you you're bigger you build more momentum you right? build more momentum but you're also getting tired so uh, you're like constantly like having to like feel these all these different obstacles that are coming your way yeah so you're doing commerce so tell me what did you do differently so we have the second pivot the second pivot was to actually target towards businesses mm you went b2b we went b2b right and we said we are actually going to make it, make it into a freemium platform and actually give it to multitudes of customers yeah and who are actually going to pay for the platform right and actually like use it i would say beginning of 2021 mhm right uh, that we had to actually make that strong decision literally mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. in like a day so then we started actually talking to a lot of customers and we asked them to pay a very small amount started off with like actually $20 a month to $200 a month kind of a thing very nice and we like actually said you can actually get video on your website for that and this was again any company any website mm-hmm. kind of scenario there was not necessarily one particular area so you cast a wide net because we cast a very wide net that's uh, that's what they recommend so if you're in a new market you're trying to do something new so i call this uh, i mean i heard this is called digital so tell us more about what firework is doing now then we'll go back to your story digital is about actually marrying the physical world with the digital world physical world married with the digital world because of covid and pandemic you know we used to go to the store to buy stuff we started buying online it was a very big shift and uh, people like firework came in and they grabbed the market and there they are at 750 million valuation <laughs> so tell us what what did you do different how does a digital model work there? see uh, originally we are always used to actually going into a store yeah. uh, asking people how or what a particular product does 
yeah. get a feedback straight from the person who's supposedly the expert sitting in the store who can right. at least explain the product right. and probably give us our best fit. Whether it's yeah. clothes, uh, fashion, whether it is beauty, whether yeah. it is you're like actually like putting something on, yeah. there's somebody who's like actually trying to make you look better with the products that they actually have in their hand. Yeah. And or whether you're actually going to an electronic store yeah. and you're actually asking all the questions saying, why is this TV different from this TV? That expertise is something very fundamental. When we moved to D2C as like a model where we are just buying it out of a website, out of convenience, yeah. it's great when you're doing repeat purchases of a product because you already know the product. Yeah. But when you're trying to understand a new product, it becomes a problem. Yeah, like when I buy on Amazon, I check out all the reviews, I look at the video, I do podcasting. So we buy lenses, we buy, uh, you know, lights, we're buying stands and you want to see what I'm paying for, right? Like Correct. mics and karaoke systems, right? So if I, if I see it on a video, it's so much more comforting. And you're like constantly looking at how many people reviewed it, what is the stars that exactly, they gave, exactly. right? Because you're like trying to figure out who else did it. Yeah. Am I actually being the first one to try it out? Right. Or am I actually being part of the crowd yeah. who actually already have reviewed it? Am I getting something that is actually like certified in some ways, right? right? Normally that comes with trust. Yeah. Here you're actually trying to find those trust in the reviews. Yeah. Your normal trust would be that person on the store. Exactly, exactly. Right. If you go to a Home Depot, you know, there's a person explaining how things work, uh, you know, and if some, he can compare prices, he can t tell what's different. Even better, right? You would actually go into a Home Depot and say, I have a problem with this window. Correct. I do not know how to seal it. Yes, and they will take you to the right place. Correct. Are you selling in the enterprise? You're not really selling to Amazon. That's a different thing about selling to Amazon. But I would say that what we fundamentally do is to enable that level of interaction on the website mm. to move a website from being a catalog online to actually being a real virtual store so do you build chatbots so chatbots is the, like the most primitive way that we actually started off doing this when i say b chatbots i'm talking are primitive okay you're <laughs> that, okay so we we actually enable one to one video oh you can actually go talk to a person on the other side very nice. Very we nice. just started launching this and the first consumers were almost like, are you real? They were actually per asking the other person saying, are you a real, real person? Real person or that are you are, a video? Oh, that's yeah. amazing. So tell me, why won't um, avatar bots disrupt this? It is going to come. Digital humans will be yeah, there. Yeah, digital humans will do this, right? They're digital human employees. Like an avatar bot is your employee. You don't have to hire a human, you hire a bot. And you keep training that bot, it gets smarter and it'll be smarter than a human in no time. Right? Correct. Yeah. Keep so, watching firework.com and you'll see that that's coming up very quickly. Okay, okay, all you guys check out. <laughs> I think the next, uh, next, I don't know, 200 million, all you VCs <laughs> watching this, <laughs> that's uh, okay, something to look out for. No, I'm fascinated, I'm very fascinated because I've started using chat GPT, GPT-4 and then mid journey and uh, stable diffusion. Oh my God, the kind of uh, productivity boost it gave me I have 10 hands now. I Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. It makes life so much easier yeah. on, on a lot of things. As an assistant, as somebody who's actually aiding you. Exactly. And that's like the first step yeah. towards it. Now, when you actually ask is, uh, why wouldn't like digital humans, that's kind of like what we call it, right. uh, disrupt it. We absolutely believe that digital humans are going to be part of it. Those digital humans will yeah. actually become something that you're going to have available, yeah. but then they're not necessarily going to answer everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It kind of like takes you back to the IVR to the person. Correct. Right. Yeah. So are you going to be satisfied with everything that they actually answer? Not necessarily. At yeah. some point, you might want to get transferred over yeah. to actually. But can they actually give you 70 to 80% there? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. And that's what will start happening. And you'd want to do that, not necessarily in a simple chat environment. Yeah. But actually on like a, I want to ask you something and you, I would rather that you reply. Yeah. Like, like the Alexas and the Google Homes that we yeah, are used absolutely. to these days. We are adapting every single day. Alexa is learning every single day. Siri is learning every single day. So they're 10 times smarter today than they were 10 months ago. On that note, the time has come for avatar bots. I know a lot of AI startups were struggling. I personally know the startup founder uh, who built uh, uh, you know, these voice services, which act like digital human voice services. That AI startup really struggled. Even now they're struggling. I see them at Tycon, all these AI events. The avatar movies generated by Midjourney, they are winning awards and stuff. So there's like two or three things about time getting there. We can actually like say, go back to as to why 
when we actually did the pivot, thought that the time was right. Because yeah. a lot of companies struggle because they are ahead of time. Nine out of ten startups are failing because they're not able to see the fit and one of the reasons is they're ahead of time. And the entrepreneur will probably end up five years later saying, how stupid was that? Was that we part? we yeah. actually like did it before anybody else. Yeah. Uh, case in point, flee around 15, 16 years ago, uh, a couple of friends and, my, and me, we, we were like running an app company startup. You and were, so this is your second startup gig. No, we, I've done multiple startup gigs to actually like end up where I am with okay. Firework. And at that time, we actually were doing apps Mm. And this was pre-iPhone. Right. For a lot of people here oh, who are okay. probably like looking at it, yeah. what does yeah. pre-iPhone mean is yeah. not something that like they would understand. Precisely. Yeah. People are back to actually like thinking that Blackberry is a fruit. And at that time, people were like <laughs> thinking Blackberry <laughs> Black was a phone. A phone. Correct, right. Correct. They wouldn't even know the fruit. It's not just that. It's also the Nokia phones and the small little phones that we were actually building apps for. We're at a point and a pivotal point and we were closed down thinking that people are not going to download apps three months before the iPhone were launched. Gosh, gosh, so you just so gave up just at the time. Where it was not us giving up, the VCs gave up on us three months ahead of that. You might actually, when you go back and think about it, we were probably, and at that point, we had more than a million monthly active users. Wow, so, so you, you could have very well sold to Apple. Or any other company, we any would have probably, company. we could have become the, one of the largest app companies, right? But we were just ahead of the time, right? So uh, tell me, wh what should the VCs have done not to give up on you? Because I see this, VCs are seeing lots of ups and downs, and apparently it's part of the startup journey, uh, the up and down. It's called, uh, I don't know, until product market fit, it's called the drunken walk. Correct. You know, you feel startup is doing well, then you feel, oh my God, what am I doing? It's not working. The question mark is, what's the environmental change that's going to happen over the next 6 to 12 months? Are the VCs in the know? Right. Are they tuned in? Yeah. Because you need to actually figure out is there drastic product market fit? Right. Change that's going to happen because of an environmental change. Right. Right. So if you really think back, not everybody would have actually thought Gen AI is possible. Like the right. company that you were talking about, right. they were struggling because struggling. Yeah. because the large LLMs were not out there for public consumption. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Suddenly something changed. Yeah. Precursor to it. Yeah. Was a bet about saying. Does the investments in open AI, is that going to pan out? Correct, correct. Right, and when are they going to launch? Because if it launches, yeah. then you're taking a bet on that launching. So you have to constantly be in the know. You're supposed to read the news. You're supposed to know what's happening, in, not only in your space, but in the neighboring space. Right. Yeah. And actually, as an entrepreneur, you need to be on the watch. Yeah. Right? So because you also need to be able to educate back. Yeah. To actually like saying this is what we are actually like seeing. Yeah. And if that's the case, then you have to make sure that your runway is going much longer for that pivotal point to actually like happen. Yeah. Right. You know, um, I just read this uh, post by one, one of seasoned Silicon Valley founders. He's one of the co-founders of Nutanix. And he says that he was AI illiterate just a few years ago. To He educated himself about this whole AI technology event. And now I think they've raised about 85 million and they're, it's at the core of their startup operations. So it's very hard being an entrepreneur. You have to learn new technology and you have to get to production quality like so quick. Yeah, how do you do that sort of thing? I know you're a chief commercial officer, but you literally have to operate in the shoes of a CEO. So how do you do that sort of thing? Like, Do you go hire the right people or um, what if they don't fit? Like, what do you do? The don't fit is always a big question mark, right? right? Because right. you're understanding don't fit is a very subjective situation. Right. And sometimes it's like you make the right decision, sometimes you make the wrong decision and you have to live by it. Yeah. Right? Because you might actually end up letting the wrong person go. Yeah. Or the wrong person might decide to uh, leave and you don't have a choice. Right. You still have to continue down that path. Yeah. Now production quality, any startup is never going to be like super production quality. They're you, not. They somehow... Uh, release the product, get the feedback, and they keep going. You can't be production quality all the time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You have to actually constantly see as to what do all customers want. Correct. If you're building bottom up on the pyramid, which yeah. is what most SaaS companies do, then you have to see what, is, what are common threads that are going across a lot right. of my customers. Right. And what do I build on those common threads, right. which will actually make my product fit right. better for right. all those customers. Yeah. Why would they use it or why are they not using it? And that's why initially it's all founder-led sales, 
right? Mm -hmm. You are like almost like talking to every customer. Mm -hmm. You are like watching what's really happening with every customer. Yeah. And you're like actually like saying, are they using it just for the heck of it? Or is it a novelty? Is it yeah. an innovation project? Is yeah. it a real uh, thing that is actually making an impact? Yeah. The moment you understand what's starting to make impact, yeah. you try to d double down to see that whether that actually spans across. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You have to again actually like switch to see what. This is kind of like what happened when we started looking at the different customers. So at a particular point, yeah. commerce companies became the best fit. Right. Right. Mm. Because they could see an ROI because the experience-based mm. selling mm. was more important than yeah. just videos that are going to be consumed for pleasure. Which metric did you track to come down and uh, narrow down on the commerce companies? What are the product metrics you track through this growth phase? Value delivery. Value are delivery. You, are you giving enough value to your customer? And how do you track value delivery? So you have to actually think in terms of the customer. Hmm. Are they actually like saying that this is because they're getting better engagement with the customer? Does the customer come back yeah. to actually like buy more? Yeah. Are they buying more? Yeah. And sometimes the metrics are not going to help you. Yeah. And you have to go solve that problem. Yeah. That, oh, they're not buying more. So let me yeah. actually figure out what's wrong yeah. and why they're not buying more. Yeah. And you almost have to solve that problem for your customer. There is a problem when people are building very new technology. They have to keep talking about it. Like uh, when I started podcasting, uh, a lot of people didn't know how important it is to do digital brand building. And uh, I really had to keep talking about it wherever I went. So how do startups who are building B2B SaaS products do it? Like they're sitting in a box, they're building code. Where do they get to talk about these things? Like how do they talk? Do they go to conferences? Do they have to have booths? Are they going to mm, do they don't get a tech crunch interview right away, right? They have to be someone <laughs> to get there. But how do you do that? So do you have to allocate budget for that? Or? So I would say, first of all, there are simple ways to actually build your brand. One is get your name across with as much of digital marketing. When I say digital marketing, it's like, you know, even on your outreach. Cont like every time there is an outreach campaign that you're doing, whether it's email, whether it is ads, whatever it is, your name is getting out there. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. If you have the right audience that are looking for it, then yeah. you are, you're gonna, your name is going to actually start popping up more and more. Yeah. Look at what they're actually like searching for. They're not yeah. searching for exactly what you're delivering. They, they have a problem. They're looking around the problem. Correct. So you got to pop up and just search for the problem. Right? Correct. Yeah. So on the outset, this is where the value delivery comes back. Mm. What is the problem that they're searching for and how can you fit into solving that, that problem? problem? Give me an example of a problem and how to gauge the value delivery, like a small use case, any product. So if you can uh, help people with positioning them, I mean, based on your experience. Let's take Firework for instance, and then we can actually talk about even other stuff. Um, if you are actually like a D2C commerce uh, person, marketing person, what are you actually looking for? You're one, looking to see how do I increase retention or repeat purchases? Yeah. How do I increase conversion rates? When you really look at conversion rates, digital conversion rates are pitiable in comparison to physical conversion. When Correct. most of the digital conversion rates are at around one to two percent. Correct. Absolutely. Think <laughs> about yeah. 100 people coming into the store and only one buying. Yeah. You would think that that's a really bad problem and that your products are not really that good. Whereas that's really what's happening in your digital world. Yeah. How do you change that? You change that because when somebody comes into your store, you start talking to them. You start actually making it conversational, right? And sometimes they might actually like say, I don't want to be disturbed, right? Yeah. There are two kinds of people, right? Yeah. yeah. They would be like, okay, I'm like just window shopping or I'm just shopping for it and then I'll like get there, right. right? The second kind of person is like, I want you to help me out because I already right. know what I want. Right. That's the same thing. So now when you get to like uh, trying to figure out how do you fit your product in, you have to actually like say, let's take the top of mind problems. Mm -hmm. Top of mind problems is getting conversion rates. Yeah. The top of mind problem is reducing your bounce rate on yeah. your D2C site because yeah. people are coming in, they're looking at something and then just bouncing off. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, the third problem is how do I make them purchase more? If you can actually say how your pro how your product yeah. is actually enabling them to do that, yeah. then whether it's the one-to-one one -one product that we launched, which is to allow your sales associate to talk to that customer yeah. or for them to talk to that person, yeah. that actually changes the mindset yeah. from the marketer as to why your product is relevant. Yeah.
right? Yeah. So this is amazing. I see that uh, there is a transformation happening. You know, people are getting into a hybrid world. Like you don't have to go and do something physically, but you are doing everything digitally. But as required, you you get access to the physical elements. You know, I was talking to a couple of my friends the other day. It seems the virtual reality headsets nowadays you can uh, watch a movie and it sprays the right smell when you're watching the movie. Like if you go to a garden with flowers and fruits, it sprays a smell into your nose. And if you're in a forest to the waterfall, you get a spray. It's a very immersive world you're getting into. Is that correct? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting one that you actually just mentioned. And I'll tell probably like an interesting scenario that maybe you want to try and maybe the viewers want to try. Yeah. Take a Coke bottle and a Fanta bottle or anything, uh, which is like completely different. Don't just close your eyes, close your nose too and try to drink it and see whether you can find the difference. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> they're, so, they're almost the same. <laughs> you, it'll be almost the same when the smell goes away. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So yeah, a lot yeah. of it is not just your taste buds, it's also your, your uh, nose. The, the olfactory, yeah, yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. So um, maybe you're thinking, you should be thinking along those lines also. For right. Product experience. Tell me, where do you uh, trump the experience centers? Experience centers are places where people go to try out a product, physical product. Let's say uh, I, I want to drive a Tesla, then I go to a Tesla showroom and I drive the car. They want to do this for all products. So how do you do better than experience centers? Where is your mode? What, so the bigger question mark is, if what is the next best thing that you can do? Yeah. Let us assume that you cannot get to that car. Yeah. Let us assume that you cannot get to that dress. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Let's just because physically it's not possible. Yeah. Right? Wow. So then what are you gonna do? I'm, right? I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm beginning to see a very huge market and augmented reality here. Right. It's not but it's also about somebody else explaining that to you. Yeah, yeah. Right? As simple as that, as as frugal as quick as that. When, yeah. when you really get down to like saying, okay, what does a Kanchivaram Sari look like? Or Correct. what does it actually like feel for you? And Correct. what's the difference between that and a Mysore silk? Correct. Who are you going to go and ask? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Ideally, it's that person in that store who can actually explain what it is yeah. in terms that you can actually like understand. Right. Right? right. And that you can ask that question. Yeah. So the more you actually get into that mode of saying, I'm bridging distance yeah. through video. Yeah it actually like changes stuff yeah. and especially when that becomes conversational yeah. between the two people, it changes. Fantastic. So, you know, on that note, uh, let's come back to your story. You said you had your second pivot and we're talking about your uh, growth from zero to 15 million. Uh, tell me how you got your first uh, uh, funding. How did you get your check? What did you say? Uh, I know that the early stage investors gave up because you pivot. You had to go to the next round of funding after your six to nine months of second pivot. What was it like pitching? How did you raise that funding? The, the initial uh, funding people didn't give up on us. I'll have to actually uh, give them credit for it. They right? believed in you. They believed, they believed, in, in, they the believed in the people. Founding team, right? They believed in the people. Very nice. They believed in the people and the problems that we were actually trying to solve that we Very will nice. find the fit. But that said, you need to actually find the investor who understands the larger picture. Yeah. Uh, that you are actually ready to paint. Yeah, so did you go to somebody who understands this space, who spent a lot of years in this space, or somebody who was risk-taking, who had risk capital? Who did you go after? So, actually, they came after us. How did they track you down? Normally, th there's enough people who like actually like watch what people do. We were actually a very silent company. We didn't actually like publicize too much. Mm. But we were kind of like actually at least having our conversations with different people. Mm. And they kind of like actually like found us. It's always the question mark. Um, so, actually, I would say that our CEO, Vincent, kind of like take, uh, talks about this every now and then, which is to say that the people that you're trying to find are also trying to find you. I think so. I think You so. just need to like figure out how do you actually end up meeting each other. Yeah, so in every party where I go, there are some people I find they're scouts. Right. They're looking for some talent, but uh, they are also people who communicate very well and they are in a lot of events, networking events. It's just uh, making that connection is what very few people are good at. Correct. They have all the information, all the access. So how do you, how do you nail those people? Ideally, you look for what they have actually invested in. Mm. If they have invested in something competing, yeah, don't go talk to them. Mm. 
right? Right, in the competitors, yeah. yeah there, there is no point. There's no point. And you don't want a VC who's like doing double bets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And trying to figure out who's going to win the race. Yeah. Right? Yeah. At some yeah. point, they have to like pick one. So also, they like, give out information. That's what I've seen. Like, one company's information, knowingly or knowingly, they do it. It's not that they want to, but. Uh, yeah, this is amazing. So, uh, so great. These are some uh, tips, but what was the magic for you? How did you find your... So, I would say that when we understood that mm -hmm. people were deriving value of what we are actually like delivering yeah. and that they were actually ready to write checks against it, yeah. then you actually know that you're starting to have a fit right. on that. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of like actually like see, is this a true fit? Are there more people? Are there more people? Is that yeah. repeatable as a process? So this is closer to series A, correct? No, I would say that this would probably be your true series B. True series B, wow. Right? You need to because have that much patience. Wow. Because okay. you in your series A, you're probably like having like five different customers, probably maybe two are good fits if you're lucky. Correct. correct. If not, you're actually going to have five very different customers and you do not know which one is a fit. Correct, correct. Right. And so you're like looking for what is actually the same color coming back again yeah. and again. So I would almost say you can take every customer that you actually build up in the beginning, put it in a different color box yeah. and say, OK, this is again, I'm seeing similar pattern. Put it in. Then if you want to like literally like think about it, yeah. you, you can actually like take that and say, OK, which color is like actually becoming more and more evident in my collection? Yeah. Right. And that actually shows the area that you want to actually like target towards. I know that this whole uh, valuation scheme is is changing so quickly. Last year, whatever was Series A, the check size is so much larger this this year. And uh, people coming from India, they're totally lost. They're like, are you if I ask them, are you seed or pre-seed or angel or Series A, they have no idea. So what what is it like now? What is typical Series A? And so uh, what is I, I would say Seed is when you're like just starting off. Is people betting on you, uh, the team, the uh, problem and the solution, right? It's yeah, and it's more you, right? Right. Sometimes it's just friends and family. Sometimes it's actually like investors that know you or investors that feel like they have a connection That's with angel. you. That's angel. That's angel, right? That's also seed. Series A, you're actually like saying, okay, I have a solution. Yeah. I have a couple of customers who are like betaing, uh, doing beta products. If if you have more than that, then it's even better. Right. Uh, as long as you can actually like hold it back. Yeah. And then you actually get into a series A that actually like takes you to that next step. Yeah. By series B, you're like trying to figure out, is there a pattern yeah. to the customers? Yeah. Right. So that's when I would say that you're almost like getting focused down yeah. to what are the areas that you want to actually create solutions for that is a repeatable scenario. And you're building your true version one. I would say that until Series B, you're not really building a version one, even though everybody thinks that thinks they're, they're building, building version, a version one. Yeah. The version one is something that people can use by themselves. Yeah. And you're actually getting there and there is an automatic fit that yeah. is actually like happening. Post Series B, I would say between B and C, you've kind of like actually figured out what you need to do to scale. Yeah, and uh, this is such a long term game, my God. I think. Building a startup, you're seven to eight years in the game. You're not going anywhere. You have to have that kind of patience. So tell me, what changes in the game once you go from Series B and beyond? Um, what kind of uh, thinkers do you need up in the management, C-level? What are they thinking? How are they thinking? So I would say that first step to the next step, or I would say the next step of scaling, is how can you actually replicate yourself? Mm, correct. To Correct. people thinking and doing what you would be doing. Without you really in one neck deep in the... Correct. Yeah. And that's the scaling from anywhere 15, 20 million dollar range to a hundred million dollar range. Yeah, you're right? kind of hands off, but you have to have a tight grip on the metrics. Right? You have to have a tight grip on the metrics. You have to set up metrics. I would say that every single thing, just like what I was talking about, about putting different colors, you have to actually have metrics that actually give you indication, right? You have to have a mechanism to actually like say, this is what is leading me to make the decisions that I'm making. So what does that spreadsheet look, look, look like for you? Coming off uh, of Series B into Series C, what does your spreadsheet look like? What are, let's say, 
name three parameters, you know, x axis and y axis. What does it look like? So if it's a traditional SaaS company, then you're absolutely looking at your burn multiples. Burn multiples. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely looking at your sales efficiency ratios. Sales, what do you mean by sales efficiency? How um, efficient is your sales and marketing numbers against what you're actually bringing in? Okay, so you know, I want to go back to burn metrics. Is it something to do with gross margins? Your it is. So it's like at the end of the day, whatever you're losing money on, yeah. you should that should actually result in growth mm. against it. If you were to actually like really think about it, this was like a uh, the burn multiple I think was introduced uh, by David was Sachs. Not profitable until a couple of years ago. That's a completely different business model, right? Because yeah. they were as, if you are doing a pure retail scenario, your margins are so low that you are actually just building up the ecosystem more and more and more but why until do you get there. Get, keep pumping money there and what should people in post series A and B think there? Like you're looking at all red numbers, everything is under profit. What keeps them going, you know? If you're if you're building it bootstrapped, then you're always thinking profit and that's a really, really good scenario. Right. 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 But your growth is going to be so, so slow. slow. You're <laughs> so gonna so actually slow. you're gonna be ready to like say, okay, lifelong, this is what I'm actually like going to They'll do. Be like, kind of like lifestyle business. Yeah. 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 Hopefully it's not a lifestyle. Though lifestyle business is not bad, right? It's not bad, if yeah. you can net a decent amount of money and you're like running a lifestyle business, there's nothing wrong with doing a lifestyle business, right? right? But that said, if you're trying to build a startup that is actually like try, trying to really grow fast, then that's a different situation altogether, no, yeah. right? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I would say that when you're like looking at this, how much is my loss yeah. and how much did my revenue increase, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Did my revenue increase commensurate to the loss? If I lost a dollar, did my revenue increase by a dollar? Then you are at least on a good path yeah. towards yeah. it, yeah. right? So then you can actually have enough runway and enough people are gonna actually like bet on you gotcha. on this, yeah. right? Sometimes you don't have to worry about margins on your infrastructure yeah. because that's actually, I would say, when you're truly scaling. Yeah, that's OPEX versus CAPEX, right? Yeah. right. So when you get to that, you'll actually like kill. So initially your burn multiples are going to be bad because you're pouring a lot of money into R&D. Correct. But as you actually get into that next stage of growth, your burn multiples start getting better and better and better. Uh, and then that moves over into all these other ratios that you can actually like look at and say, am I doing the right investments? Yeah. If I'm actually buying customers at a very high price, yeah. then it's not worth it, right? Because they never, I'm not going to get a it's payback. The, the CAC, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Right, so the CAC payback time is the a very, L very interesting. LTV to CAC ratio. Correct. Right, right. But actually more than the LTV to CAC, I would say the payback is something that you need to watch, which is I spend $2,000 on getting this customer, but if they're paying me $50 a month. That's not a good, yeah. Yeah, you're going to have four years before you actually like really get the money back on that customer. I want to keep digging here, but I know I'm out of time, but see there are, um, three phases in the growth stage of a B2B SaaS company. I'll just quickly ask you to summarize. First is product market fit, then is go to market fit, then is the growth and the moat. So can you tell us one nugget of wisdom or one story in each of this? The product market fit is all about trying to find customers who derive value, Correct. who derive the maximum value from your product. Yeah. Right. And that's why I said, and it needs to be repeatable. Yes. If it's repeatable, then it's fine. Yeah. Right. The growth is more about optimizing what's it actually going to cost to get that customer and are you able to do it in an efficient manner so that you can get lots and lots and lots of customers right. who are actually going to do that. In some cases that might be lots and lots could be tens, in some cases it's thousands, yeah. in some cases it's hundreds. In most SaaS companies it's hundreds and thousands Correct. that you actually get into for a scale. While you do that, you need to start building your moat. Yeah, right? so, so the, the go to market fit, when does that happen? Go to market. I would say that by the time you get to tens of customers or hundreds of customers who are using the product the same way and deriving similar kind of value out of it, then you have a go to market, go to market fit. fit. Okay. Right. Uh, and then when you actually get to like scaling, are you scaling efficiently? Yeah. And while you're scaling efficiently, are you building your barriers to entry so that somebody else who is doing it slightly efficiently or slightly cheaper than what you're doing cannot eat your lunch yeah, after you yeah. actually like got the customer on board. Yeah. That's I would say where you start building your moat. In these scenarios, because the market and SaaS has actually become so much more normal these days, you almost have to think multi-products, 
how do I start actually like creating a tighter relationship with the customer? How do I solve multiple pain points to start creating modes? Because it's not just one that they have to like remove out of the system. On that note, thank you so much, uh, Anand, Pityanan. I know that it's a very busy day for you and your phone has been ringing constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're there. it's close of quarter, a lot of things are happening. Thank you so much for coming here. Any last thoughts for our listeners? Uh, on building rocket ship startups. What does it take to build rocket ship startups? Persistence. Persistence. Watch the environment. You're always going to actually get hit with random curveballs. Yeah. It's about how do you actually like tackle those curveballs and where are you on that line and probably figure out what's going to motivate you. Sometimes things like atomic habits probably like help. How can I be a little bit better the next day? You have the mindset of playing a game. You're a person who likes to play a game and win a game. There's a lot we learn Correct. when you play a game and all the examples you quoted, you're constantly aware of where I'm getting hit, how right. do I win. It's one way to look at life. I'm in it a is. game, winning and losing is part, yeah. part of it. And then, you know, how do I keep that mindset? That it's way. a long journey. You just it's have to actually, yeah. On that amazing note, thank you so much for joining us on Pitch Cafe. Thank you so much, Anand, for your time. Please do come back. It was lovely chatting with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.